Hi, my name is John. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you just how easy it is to build the Posner task in the Psychopy Builder view. Uh, we're going to build it so that you can respond with a mouse or with a touch screen. You'll even be able to push it online and respond using an iPad, but I'm going to save that part for another tutorial. First thing we need with a new experiment is obviously our stimuli and conditions file that will specify how our different conditions work. I've done these for you already with Posner tasks so that you can uh, save doing that step. I've put them in posner.zip at psychopi.org so you can download them from there. When you open this zip folder you really need to extract the files from it. So I'm going to drag Posner first out of posner.zip and right now I'm just putting that on the desktop you can put that wherever you like but it's really important that you extract the files from the zip file first. Now within that folder we've got something called conditions.xlsx and we've got another folder called images. Inside there we've got three PNG files so PNG is a type of graphics file. JPEGs are great for photographs but PNG files are a good type of file format if you haven't got photographic material. In particular, they allow a transparent background. So this is a red arrow, not on a white square, but on a transparent square. And that means we can put it into our, into our experiment and it won't draw a white square around it in the background. So those are things that we're going to use for our task. And this is the way that the conditions will look for the posing task. So in the poser task, we're going to have an arrow pointing to the left or an arrow pointing to the right. And then 80% of the time, that's going to predict where a target subsequently appears. So in the conditions file, we've got some columns. Each one specifies a different variable. So here we've got the Q file variable, the target X variable, and the is valid variable. These variables have to have no spaces or punctuation in their names, and they have to have a unique name. The Q file on each trial is something like this. So we've got images slash arrow left.png, that's the files that we were just looking at. And I'm specifying that in the images folder. It's going to be relative to the location of the experiment, which is going to be right next to the images folder. And I'm using a forward slash here, not a backslash. The forward slash will work on all computers. Backslash is something that specifies a folder only on Windows. So if you want to then upload this to the web, your experiment will stop working. So we're using a forward slash here, just like in um, a URL address on the internet. And then we've got the target position in, in its X coordinate, which sometimes I'm setting to minus 0.5 and sometimes plus 0.5. So in PsychoPy, 0, 0 is always the center of the screen. Minus 0.5 is going to be half the height of the screen to the left of fixation, and this is going to be half the height of the screen to the right of fixation. So in those eight conditions, those are all valid cues, the cue will point to the same location as the target. In these two trials at the end, we've got invalid cues because the arrow points to the left, but the target actually appears on the right. And the key to the pose of task is measuring the difference in reaction times when we've got these invalid cues versus the valid ones. Okay, so that's our conditions file. We're ready to start creating our experiment then. We're going to use the builder view here. You can switch between different PsychoPy views using the view menu, so you can go to the coder view, the runner view for running your studies that you've already built. But we're going to use the builder view, and I recommend that you use builder even if you are a competent programmer. It's going to help you build studies faster, you're going to make fewer mistakes, and at the end of it, you can run your study both online or on your desktop, which is going to be a, a huge help. Also, in the future, when you come back to your study, you'll know how it works because you can see it graphically, whereas working out what a study does from many lines of code is, is tricky. In this Builder view, we've got a routine, one or more routines, We've got a number of components that can be used to construct that routine, various stimuli, responses, custom objects, and our favorite sharp here, the ones that we've used most often. 
And then we can combine multiple routines in the bottom in this flowchart that you'll see gradually being used more through the study. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is save this experiment. Sorry, and I'm going to save it next to, inside that folder, Posner first was the folder that I was wanting, next to the images, I'm going to call this Posner, and now you'll see there's a Psychopite experiment Posner next to images. Right, it has to be next to images because relative to the experiment was, was the way that I labeled those image files in the conditions. What do we need to do in one trial of the poster task? We need some images. We need an image to specify the queue. So we need an image object. I'm going to call it queue. We'll set that to start at 500 milliseconds or 0.5 seconds and we'll set it to last for 0.2 or 500, 200 milliseconds. So by starting at 0.5, this is essentially given uh, a 500 millisecond gap after the last trial has finished. Now the image on this occasion isn't just the name of the image in its location. This is a variable. This is something that we want to change on each trial. So on this occasion, we're going to call this dollar $q underscore file. So $q underscore file was the name of that heading in the Excel spreadsheet. And dollar is telling Psychopy, treat this box as code, not as literally the string Q file. And I'm going to say set every repeat, okay, because we want this trial, we want this image to change on each trial. What else do we want to do? Position, zero, zero, center of the screen, that's good. I'm going to change this for now to be 0.3, we're wide and high. So we're currently using height by default. We're using experiment settings. We'll go and have a look at that in a moment. And in experiment settings, you'll see that the default is for it to be in height units. So this is a third of the height of the screen, 30% of the height of the screen, and 30% of the width of the screen. And all of those things are left to be constant. We also need another image. So I'm going to click on that icon again. And this one's going to be the target, if I can spell it. Again, those names, like the columns in the Excel spreadsheet, all have to be unique, and they mustn't use spaces, mustn't use punctuation. I'm going to set this target to start when the queue has finished, so at 0.7 seconds. I'm going to leave the duration blank. I want this to last forever. So we'll end the trial when the participant responds but we'll leave the target there and just wait for them to click on it. This time the image is constant. It, the image is images forward slash target dot png. And we leave it as constant. Okay, That's going to load the image at the beginning of the experiment and uh, just reuse it on each trial. Similarly, I'm going to set the size of the stimulus to be 0.3, 0.3. And this time we need to change the X position of the target on each trial. So this time I'm going to use that dollar symbol again here. So dollar, so this box is now code and we want it to be target underscore X. Again, that was the name of the column in my conditions file. Now I'm going to set every repeat. This is giving me a little warning here to remind me that I need to set every repeat for something that's a variable. Okay. Now we need a response, and we're going to use a mouse for a response. So I'm going to click on that. I'm going to call it resp. A mouse will work on your desktop, but it will also act as a for as a response device for a touch screen. So if you if you click on a touch screen, it will look like a mouse click. And later on, when we run online, if we click using an iPad um, on the screen, then that will also look like a mouse click. So all of these are, are going to work right out of the box using the mouse. We're going to start this at 
the same time as the target, 0.7 seconds. And again, we're going to leave the duration blank. People can respond whenever they like. Critically though, we're going to end the routine when they click on the target. We don't want to end the routine when they click anywhere, but they could end the routine just by clicking on the background, that wouldn't be good. We want them to click only when they click on the target. So I'm gonna select valid click for end routine. Save the mouse state. We want to know about the clicks. So on the click, save the mouse state. The time relative to mouse onset. Okay, so here we're measuring the reaction time that will start at 0.7 seconds, which is the time that the target has appeared. And that's what will define our, our reaction time zero. New clicks only, yes, we don't want people to click before the target appears. And clickable stimuli, I'm gonna say target. So that's got to be the name of a, of a stimulus. Or you don't have to have any clickable stimuli, but here we're using the, the target is a thing that the participant can click on. We've essentially just turned the target into a button here. You could have multiple things that were clickable. You could have a target and a foil, for instance, but we just have a target. And we can store the name of the, of the thing that was clicked. Okay, that's what one trial looks like. Pretty easy to set up. Now we obviously don't just want one trial, we need multiple trials and we need them to change on each repeat. So I'm going to insert a loop in this flow diagram at the bottom around my trial. And clicked insert loop and then I selected a start point and usually you'd need to select an end point, although this time that was automatic. So here's my trials loop. You could have a, a loop of blocks, you could have a loop of stimuli, it's going to be a random loop and I'm going to randomly shuffle my conditions file. So I'm going to click browse, select my conditions file, and it's loaded that and told me there are 10 conditions with three parameters, Q file target X and is valid. Okay, 10 conditions, we've got five repeats. That's going to be a total of 50 trials. That's quite a lot for just doing our demo. So I'm going to, I'm going to set that to two repeats, which will be 20 trials. And they're going to be 20 trials shuffled on each repeat. Okay. To run our study, we're going to press either the green running man or press control R, it's the same thing. And that's going to bring up in this version 2020.1, 20, it's going to bring up the runner view, which allows us a more information about whether or not there are potential problems, allows us also some we can open just the runner view and select experiments that we've already created. We press the green running man or press control R again in order to actually run the study. When we do that, it brings up a dialog box. I'm going to call this subject 01. And I'm going to use a trackpad, not really as fast as a mouse, or a touch screen to <laughs> click on the targets as fast as I can. Okay, and that's one run of the study complete. To analyze our data, if we look inside this Posner folder again, there's the Posner experiment, the conditions file, there's now also a Python file called Posner last run, and there's a new folder called data. Inside the data folder, we've got a CSV file, a log file, and a SIDAT. We're not going to look at those two today, but um, don't throw them away. They're useful files to keep around. For So log files are quite useful in tracking down timing problems, for instance. CSV file will usually open in Excel or something similar, and this is where we can usually do a basic analysis. So in the proposal task, we want to compare trials that were valid with trials that were invalid 
in terms of their reaction time. And these are the chronological trials as they were run with a number of variables. In, and often you'll have a large number of variables along this top. I'm looking for the, re the response time, in this case, column Q. So these are all values that correspond to that mouse object, the resp object is what I called it in the experiment. I'm going to hide some of these though because I don't need most of them and I want to get my column Q close to my column C in order to visualize more easily what I'm doing. I'm also going to add a new column in here to insert my averages. First thing I need to do is sort. I'm going to sort by whether or not my trial was a valid Q trial. My data has headers so I can select that column heading is valid. I've got four trials of invalid Q. I'm going to do equals average and select my four reaction times. And then I'm going to do equals average for the valid reaction times. And we can see a response time of 841 milliseconds, 842, versus 701 on average to valid queues. And that's the Posner queuing effect that I'm faster to respond to the valid queue trials. Okay, I hope you agree that that was pretty straightforward. It's a pretty intuitive interface, and hopefully easy enough for all of your teaching needs. It's also pretty flexible, so you can expand up on this flow, you can have more routines as you need, you can have nested loops, so you can have blocks around your trials, etc. And that makes it flexible enough to really run a very, very wide range of tasks. I hope you found this an informative tutorial and hope you have fun building experiments.